Uh, Mr. President, uh, I know that the uh, Senate is now considering whether we should vote on the motion to proceed to the urgent supplemental bill. That means under our rules of another century, we don't actually get to a bill. We debate or even have a filibuster on whether we should even move to the bill. It was designed to really cool the passions of the time so the Senate could be the greatest deliberative body in the world. However, these procedures now have been distorted that we're no longer the greatest deliberative body in the world, we're the greatest delaying body in the world. Delay has become not only a tactic to come up with better ideas, delay has become an, out, an outcome into itself. We are facing a really serious problem in our country, and I would hope we would vote on the motion to proceed so we could actually get on the legislation for the urgent supplemental funding to deal with three crises facing our country, one of which is wildfires burning in the West in which property, communities, livelihoods are being destroyed and first responders are being exhausted. And while they're being exhausted, local and state funds are being exhausted along with the forest <coughs> service of our own government. We need to stand with our neighbors in these Western states because this is a calamity. The presiding officer was the mayor of a great city uh, in New Jersey, Newark. He knows what happens when a hurricane hits a city and hits a state. New Jersey, God, we're still, you could tell me, and I know you've spoken frequently, about how New Jersey's trying to still recover from FEMA, <coughs> excuse me, from Sandy. Well, the fire situation, fire raging in the western states are their hurricane, they're their tornado. There, it's there, Sandy. And I would hope that we would pass the $615 million to help our own fellow citizens in the eight Western states. Then we have a treasured ally that is under attack by a terrorist organization that needs to defend itself using a technology called the Iron Dome and they defend themselves by shooting interceptor rockets. It's not an offensive rocket, shoot to kill, it's shoot to defend. They're using up these rockets at an unprecedented rate, and the Secretary of, the Secretary of Defense has sent a letter to the Congress asking for $225 million to be able to replenish this. Then we have a crisis in Central America with the violence being created by the narco traffickers or the narco terrorists that is causing a surge of children coming to our country. I would hope that we would pass the money to address those needs, which I'll elaborate on in a minute. So I would hope that this isn't gonna be another day when after all is said and done, more gets said than gets done. We need to respond to the needs that are being presented to us. And Mr. President, I want to talk about the children. Much has been said here about the children. Much has been said about President Obama's failed immigration policy. We need National Guard. We need to give them police powers, all of that. Well, I'm glad that many senators are now going down to the border. I went down to the border myself. I wanted to see the situation as chair of the Appropriations Committee. I wanted to see, number one, was there an urgent need? Number two, what would it take to meet that need? And number three, how could we work together on a bipartisan nation, bipartisan basis, to protect the children and to protect our own country? Well, I got an eyeful. I got an eyeful. And I just want to tell you about it. When I went down to the border, and I traveled with the Secretary of Homeland Security, and I traveled with Secretary Burrell, head of HHS, we went to the McQuillan Border Patrol Station, and we also went to Lachlan Air Force Base, where children were being temporarily housed. 
and had the opportunity to meet with really great Border Patrol agents, wonderful faith-based organization caring for the children, fantastic young lawyers uh, from the University of Texas Austin campus and St. Mary's Law School, law students and professors making sure the kids had legal services on a pro bono basis, doing it on their own time and their own dime. So we saw a lot. And then I had the chance to talk to the children. Well, first I'm gonna talk about the number of the children. We are acting like we are under siege rather than facing a surge. I think there's a big difference between feeling under siege than under us kids with the surge. We are talking as of this minute, 60,000 children. Now that's a lot of children, but you know what? If you came to Baltimore and we went to Raven Stadium, Raven Stadium holds 60,000 people. We're not talking 600,000. We're not talking 6 million. We're talking 60,000 children. Maybe it'll swell to 90,000. All 90,000 still could fit in the new Dallas Stadium. So we're talking about a number so small, so small that it could fit, could fit into an American stadium. We are a people of 300 million people. Certainly, we can deal with 60 children, 60,000 children feeling traffickers in drugs and sexual slavery. I mean, aren't we big enough? Aren't we strong enough? And aren't we tough enough to be able to deal with that? I think that we are. And when you see what's going on, you would know kind of what I mean. So let's face, let's talk about this. So let's talk about these 60,000 children. It's literally a children's march across Guatemala, uh, Honduras, and El Salvador through Mexico and coming to the Rio Grande. They're not coming across all 1,900 miles of the border. They're coming to a specific area and they cross the river on rafts, they swim, they do what they can. Now, when you come to McQuillan, which, and, and how this begins, and it goes like this. The children either come on their own, or they come because a smuggler or a coyote brings them. It means that some mother, some father, some aunt, right now in the United States of America, making the minimum wage, making the minimum wage is gonna scrape together the three to five grand that the smuggler says we can deliver, kind of like a FedEx or a UPS for human beings, we'll deliver them to the Rio Grande border. So they scrape together the money and they are willing, the violence is so bad that they are willing to trust a crook to be able to bring the children. They come through and they leave and they trek. They trek through a jungle. They trek through filth and dirt and danger. They stop at what they call safe houses. That's an oxymoron. There is nothing safe about a safe house where you have children with also all kinds of other people on that road where the children are taken advantage of. And I won't describe it. So from this safe house, they finally make it to the border. Some ride a train called the Beast. This is a cargo plane. It's not a nice little lovely train that maybe goes up and down our coast from Boston to Savannah. This is a train called the Beast. The children ride the top of these trains, holding each other, clutching each other. I talked to a little girl about nine years old who told me she rode for two days and had to stay awake for 48 hours because she was afraid of falling off where she could lose an arm, a leg, or death itself. Now, why would children risk this? Why would parents risk this? It's because of the danger, the danger, danger, danger in Central America. So we don't, we're talking about arming the border more. We need to go after arming the fight against the narco traffickers in Central America and also dealing with our insatiable, 
insatiable appetite for drugs that fuels this. So that's what's driving this. And when they say send the children back, what are they going to send them back to? What are they going to send them back to? The ones recruiting the boys to engage in criminal activity? The girls to be recruited into human trafficking? It's not like we're going to send them back on a plane and there's going to be Juan Diaz, you know, with a ro yellow roses saying, welcome back the children of Honduras or El Salvador. They're going to go right back into the very danger that they ran from. When I went to the McQuillan Border Patrol Station, this is what we call a detention facility. Now, it was designed to detain adults, underline that word, and it was designed to hold up to 300 people, usually adult, illegal immigrants trying to cross the Rio Grande. These really look like cells, C-E-L-L-S like cells. These are cement cinder block facilities that were designed to hold 10 or 12 adults, and they hold as much as 20 or 30 children sleeping on the floor, the Border Patrol doing the very best that they can, the Border Patrol taking care of children because we can't move them to humanitarian facilities like the law requires. You talk to children who are taking turns when sleeping on, to stand, sitting on a cement block to even be able to rest. Hundreds there, 20 and 30 in a room, sleeping on floors, using empty water bottles for pillows, uh, these kind of blankets that are, look like aluminum foil. These are the lucky ones. They come in from the overfill outdoor area where often the boys are in a covered area where they sleep outside and the girls, quote, and can be inside, but in these holding cells. Very limited showers, very limited hygiene. The Border Patrol doing everything they could. It's not something you're used to seeing in the United States. I know there's another CODEL going, go. Go, 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 and go see this. I talked to a 12-year-old girl. She was in charge of bringing her six-year-old sister. Their parents sent him to escape the gang violence. The mother told the older girl, watch out for your younger sister. Don't, don't let her out of your sight until you get to your America and try to get to your aunt. I talked to a 15-year-old girl from Honduras. Both of her parents had been killed by gang violence. She worked in a restaurant to save enough money to pay the coyote. It took her two months to get to the United States, escaping violence along the route to get here. You're going to send her back? You're going to send the six-year-old back? Wow. Now, I then had the opportunity, so you just see what these conditions are. And you talk to the Border Patrol agents. They want to be law enforcement guys. And gee, are they terrific. They are really terrific. And they know that the surge at the border is being caused by the criminal activity there. They talked openly about, we know who the seven, there are seven organized crime syndicates that are sparking a lot of this. They know about the false recruitment of young people, promising them a new day and a new way to get to the United States of America. So they know about that, and they want to be able to do law enforcement, but in order for them to be able to do what they do, we have to have facilities for the children to be housed, clothed, and fed while their legal status is being determined under the law. Now, I went up to Lakeland, Lakeland Air Force Base. Now, the children are being cared for in unused dormitory, dormitories that once housed our our. Air Force. We have new facilities for our enlisted personnel. But do you know that we pay for that? That the Department of Health and Human Services has to pay the Department of Defense to house those children. And because it's on a military base, with all the rules and regs associated with that, it is the most expensive housing we can have, but it is the best housing that we have. And right now, because of this 
rejectionist fear that is being promulgated through our country, like somehow or the other these children pose a danger to us, uh, it is the best we can do. And I will tell you, it's a very nice facility. And I saw it being operated by a faith-based organization, the Baptist Conference. Hats off to them. I speak now as a social worker, a professionally trained social worker. It was one of the most outstanding child welfare service organizations I'd seen, from the, from the nurses to the social workers to those who were trying to interview the children. They were doing a fabulous job, but they are under a contract. So though they are a voluntary faith-based organization, they're being compensated for their time and services because that's what we should be able to do. We want to be able to use groups like that all over America. What was so heartwarming to me, Mr. Uh, uh, president was that Catholic Charities in Oklahoma had come to Texas to see what the Baptists were doing because they were getting ready to help take the kids. That's kind of like the America way. That was kind of the American way to see Catholic Charities learning from the Baptists all concentrating on the welfare of children represent knowing that these are all children in God's eyes with human beings, with dignity. And then I talk to the legal services people. This goes to those lawyers, the law professors, the law students, University of Texas, Austin, St. Mary's College. Their services that they were providing was on their own time and their own dime. They were using up their money their summertime, there was no compensation, even for expenses, so that they could begin the interview process to determine if any of these children had the right, had the opportunity to maybe voluntarily return home, because it was clear the coyotes had misled many, that's true, and so on. Well, they were doing that. Well, we can't keep doing this on this emergency patchwork basis. We need the urgent supplemental, number one, to help the, the Homeland Security law enforcement be them, help health and human services that they need to crack this backlog and be able to place these children. Yes, their legal status, should they, are they, do they have the right for refugee status to be determined? And even when you have volunteer legal services, like the outstanding work I saw in Texas, outstanding. I know you're a lawyer, you would have been proud of them. And, um, and the way they were just responding to these children. Bilingual, remember, the services have to, but there, you need help, you need paralegals, you need this. So, and I want to break the backlog of judges uh, the backlog of cases so we have enough immigration judges to do this. So I tell you this story, like there's so much myth, so much misinformation, so much um, distortion out there that I am afraid that we will end this day and not vote to proceed to the urgent supplemental, debate it and discuss it and then vote on it, that it'll just languish. And as a social worker, I just want to say, what I've seen these children go through is unimaginable. They've come here to escape violence and death. They deserve to be treated with compassion and integrity. And they deserve us to do our job. And anyone who thinks we should just deport these children without giving them every right affording them under their law should go down to McQuillan and look into their eyes and listen to their stories. The time is to act now, but let's put together a comprehensive program. And I believe we can really meet this surge, deal with the real root cause, and be able to function in a way that we're all proud of. Uh, Mr. President, I yield the floor.